Welcome. My name is Stacey Blakely. I'm the executive director of the Policy Circle. And this is a virtual briefing. And in light of recent events around the world, we decided uh, to step out of our typical format of Move the Needle and engage in a conversation with uh, some thought leaders, policymakers to gain further insight into what we believe is an issue all of our members need to be paying close attention to. So I am joined uh, this, uh, this morning, this afternoon, whatever time we're watching this, by Ambassador Kurt Volker. He is a leading expert in U.S. foreign and national security policy. He served as the U.S. Special Representative for Ukraine negotiations from 2017 to 2019 and as U.S. Ambassador to NATO from 2008 to 2009. Good morning, Kurt. Good to see you. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, whatever it may be. And thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. Let's go ahead and jump right in. For those of us that are not necessarily familiar with the history and territorial makeup of the Ukraine, can you explain why uh, Putin chose these breakaway regions as sort of the first area of invasion or incursion? Well, it, it's a great question. I'm delighted to give some background on this. First off, these aren't the first areas. Uh, in 2014, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and took over the Crimean Peninsula and it then annexed Crimea to Russia, this kind of seizing territory by force. Again, something we had not seen since World War II. Uh, so this was already done back in 2014. The West reacted very slowly, and I would say um, timidly to this Russian action. Uh, we put in place some sanctions uh, after uh, Russia seized Crimea, but not really very serious ones. And we did it after the fact. Putin, I believe, was encouraged by this and thought that he could take more of Ukraine. So he launched a further invasion in eastern Ukraine, in these, in these areas we're now talking about, Donetsk and Luhansk. He did it through hybrid warfare. He sent in uh, soldiers without any insignia on their uniforms, intelligence officers, mercenaries, and he paid the local population, local activists and thugs to uh, take over uh, local administrative buildings and create the appearance of an uprising. Uh, it was a Russian invasion, but it done under a guise of an internal strife. Uh, that war went further and deeper into Ukraine uh, at that time in 2014 and 2015. The Ukrainians fought back and created a ceasefire uh, line with German and French negotiating assistance uh, where that line is now sitting today. Uh, this was all eight years ago. Russia has occupied this territory for the past eight years. It has propped up these so-called Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics. It pays for the administration. It provides the security. It provides the intelligence. Uh, it leads the military effort. And it continue, has continued to be low-level fighting with sniper fire and mortar fire almost every day for eight years. So that's the status quo before Russia's massive military buildup last autumn and what has happened now. What Russia then did by putting these massive military forces in Ukraine and around Ukraine was trying to extract concessions from Ukraine and from the West that Ukraine uh, would never become a member of NATO, uh, that there would be no NATO in Ukraine, no Western military forces or support for Ukraine's defense capabilities, uh, that NATO enlargement itself would be stopped and the deployment of military forces to defend NATO countries would be rolled back away from Russia. Uh, these are extraordinary demands that Russia made back in December of this year under the threat of a gun, under the threat of these 190,000 troops intervening. Uh, there was a firm response from the US and from NATO saying no, we're not going to sign over Ukraine's sovereignty to you. We're not recognizing that you have some special sphere of influence over your neighboring countries. Uh, we respect the sovereignty and independence of all of these people, and we're going to stand up for that. So that left us in a situation of a standoff and several meetings between President Biden and President Putin, other European leaders and President Putin, uh, Secretary Blinken and Foreign Minister Lavrov. All of these have been fruitless because Russia is not budging off of these extravagant demands. Then after the failure to gain what it wanted by threats, it decided to go ahead and move in militarily to these pieces of Eastern Ukraine that it already occupies. So instead of this now being a covert occupation, uh, they have done it overtly. 
they have recognized these territories as independent states. They put in Russian military forces directly. And the worry now that everyone has is that they are going to expand beyond that territory into other parts of Ukraine that they don't currently occupy. Well, and in switching from that that covert to overt occupation, and obviously there was all kinds of political theater around that in terms of uh, the, the 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 speeches, the letters, the appearances uh, of support in in Russia. I'm, I'm wondering, Kurt, can you share with us? You know, what is it that you're hearing out of Russia in terms of popular support for these actions uh, to the extent we're able to gauge that? Um, you know, is there support in the country of Russia for this type of activity? Uh, uh, it's hard to say. First off, Russia is not a free country. There's no free media. The, the words and images that we see are either created by the Kremlin for us to see uh, or uh, they reflect a reticence on the part of the population to say or do anything out of fear of reprisals. Uh, so we have a hard time seeing it. What Putin showed us uh, on Sunday after he announced, I think it was Sunday, maybe it was Monday, um, when he announced that he was recognizing these territories as independent states, uh, they showed flags waving and fireworks and people celebrating in the streets. Uh, who knows <laughs> what that really was right. and how many people that was. That was the, the Kremlin orchestrated propaganda that they wanted us to see. What I think we do know, however, is that there is great dissatisfaction in Russia with Putin's rule. Uh, there have been demonstrations across Russia consistently over the past several years. And his uh, main opposition figure, uh, Navalny, uh, he tried to kill him by sure. poisoning him and he keeps him in prison now. So he's obviously concerned that there is opposition to him within Russia. Otherwise, why bother? So he, he clearly sees this as some kind of threat. And I also think we've seen in the past uh, Russian citizens, civilians, particularly mothers of soldiers, uh, protest when Russia has launched military aggression that they can't understand. Mm -hmm. And I think in this case, no one in Russia is going to be sympathetic to images of Russian soldiers entering Ukraine and killing Ukrainians or Russians being killed by Ukrainians as they try to, to take over their country. Um, this would not be popular. And I think it is probably one of the few things that may deter Putin from going too far. Well, and you talk about deterring Putin. That's a, a, an interesting situation we have here. And I've kind of got a two part question for you. Why now? What factors, what actions perhaps the U.S. has taken or not taken? Um, obviously, we have sort of a different approach between the last two administrations, but it goes back much further than that, as you pointed out, in terms of, of historical engagement here. Why do you think that Putin is perhaps more emboldened or willing to take whatever risk he may think are associated with this type of, uh, you know, it, it, a move of, of major aggression. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we should start with Putin's ambition. Uh, his ambition is to rebuild a Russian empire on the territory of the former Soviet Union. And he's been very explicit about this, both in his remarks when he recognized these two breakaway territories on Monday, but also in an article he wrote, a very long article back in July. So he's been clear he is trying to reassemble the pieces uh, and has described the collapse of the Soviet Union as uh, one of the greatest tragedies of the, uh, one of the greatest catastrophes of the 20th century. So he's on a mission. He has taken over the security apparatus and the media and basically made Belarus a dependent state. He has done the same in Kazakhstan, taken over the security apparatus there. He has taken pieces of Georgia, uh, provinces called Abkhazia and South Ossetia. He controls part of Moldova, which is a province called Transnistria. He took Crimea from Ukraine. Uh, he has already occupied parts of Luhansk and Donetsk for eight years. And now he's taking a bit more, perhaps. So he's been on this project for a long time. But you're right. There is something different this year. And this year is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Soviet Union. Uh, in 1922. And I think Putin sees a place for himself in history as uh, you know, pulling this back together and being a better leader than the Soviet leaders were or than the Russian leaders were at the end of World War I. Uh, so I think that's one dynamic. But another, and I, here I hate to say it, but I believe it's true, uh, he sees weakness in the West. 
he sees a divided United States, po politically polarized, uh, he, wanting to pull out of wars and conflicts abroad. Uh, he saw the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, where we weren't even willing to keep 2,500 troops on the ground in order to maintain a stable situation. And then the unwillingness even to go in and pull out American citizens who were stranded, whereas other countries were doing that. So I think he perceived a lack of willingness to use force, a, a lack of comfort with the exercise of power. And that's just on the United States. If you look at Europe, uh, he sees uh, Chancellor Merkel having stepped down now and a new untested German government coming in with his friends, the SPD in charge, <laughs> running the chancellery now. Uh, you have Macron facing a re-election in France and wanting to portray himself as a different uh, European leader, separate from the United States. He called NATO brain dead not long ago. Uh, you have Brexit, which has the, the UK now not coordinating its security and defense policies with the EU and the EU being weaker as a result. You have a lot of friends of Putin in Europe who are trying to maintain doing business uh, with Russia, including Germans on gas supplies, including Hungary, including Italians. So um, he sees a weak and divided Europe, a weak and divided United States, a lack of resolve to support Ukraine. And let's also remember that both President Biden and European leaders have been explicit right. that we will not provide U.S. or NATO forces to help Ukraine defend itself. We'll train them, we'll equip them, but they're on their own. So this is largely a green light to, to Putin right now. It's not going to get better for him. Over time, Ukraine will get stronger, Russia will get weaker. Maybe we'll have different and stronger leadership again in the United States and in Europe. So now's the moment for him. And with those factors, how effective are these economic sanctions that were announced yesterday going to be? And if you don't mind, maybe explaining to uh, to us sort of what the nature of those sanctions are. Obviously, it was all sort of an economic focus, but could you sort of give us maybe your take on the sanctions and sort of explain whether or not those have any hope of being effective? Yeah. So again, let's let's put this in context. The U.S. and Europe have had sanctions against Russia for a long time now for a variety of reasons, for their seizure of Crimea in 2014, for the war they started in uh, Donbass in 2014, and their failure to implement the Minsk agreements, also on human rights abuses and the Magnitsky Act. That's another set of sanctions. But thus far, we have not applied very severe sanctions against Russia. These have been modest. Russia has adapted and they haven't altered Russia's behavior at all. In fact, as we see now, they're defiant in the face of this. Yesterday's sanctions that were announced were insignificant. Uh, the administration has promised that there would be devastating sanctions against Russia's economy and financial system if they invade Ukraine again. Um, they have invaded again. So I think we should anticipate that after coordinating with the EU, there will be these devastating sanctions announced. But that's not what we saw yesterday. Uh, yesterday was uh, sanctions on a few individuals in Putin's inner circles and banks, but not the serious ones that we've been promised thus far. Uh, Germany announced that it would not certify uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline as long as this war is going on, which basically means they're prepared to certify it later if we can get this to stop. Uh, so, so far, there's nothing, no signaling in here that Putin is going to take seriously. Moreover, he has launched military forces and is in a, a military logic at the moment, uh, which means that I don't think any sanctions will change his decision making on the use of force at this time. Uh, sanctions at this stage would be designed to have a longer term impact so that when there is some stable ceasefire line again, that it erodes Russia's ability to sustain this and it will cause uh, Russians and possibly even President Putin to want to end the sanctions. Uh, but that's a longer term proposition of what these sanctions should do. And in terms of military conflict, as you stated, NATO, the US, EU partners, none have been willing, and in fact, they've stated the opposite. They're unwilling to engage uh, yes. in a military operation. And so it, to the extent you end up with widespread conflict in the Ukraine, what does that look like for the rest of the world? What are the implications of uh, true conflict if Putin decides to fully invade the Ukraine? 
Yeah, you know, it's a very interesting question. And I, I read something about this yesterday that made me think. Um, when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, uh, we intervened with a coalition of countries, a large coalition of countries, to push the Iraqis back and restore Kuwaiti independence. Mm -hmm. uh, this set a set of norms in the world, a set of expectations that you don't just roll into a foreign country and take it over, uh, that if you do, there will be uh, resistance to that. Russia is obviously different than Iraq uh, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that it has nuclear weapons. Uh, but if it gets away, with this brazen aggression against uh, uh, Ukraine, taking over all or even some of the country just through the exercise of military force, and they get away with it. This will be a signal to countries all over the world and also to Russia elsewhere that you can do this. You know, the, the era of this being unacceptable since the 1990s has ended, and you can get away with this. And that's something I think we in the West really need to think hard about. We obviously don't want to be in a conflict with Russia. We don't want to risk a nuclear conflict with Russia. But we also can't afford to live in a world where it is just the rule of the jungle all over again. Well, and you talk about this sort of uh, setting a, a dangerous new course for foreign policy and really as America stepping back from its historic leadership role and of course, we look at issues related to China and mm -hmm. what sort of a message this sends. And so, you know, in terms of, of that ripple effect, I do think it is interesting to see China is sort of waiting in the wings, it seems here, in terms of, of their engagement. I haven't read much about this, Ambassador Volker, in terms of it's been very quiet. So are, what are you hearing in terms of of what we're going to get maybe from the East, as opposed to we're all talking about the West response right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, several things here. And I, I'm, I'm smiling when you say you haven't read much about it, because I can imagine why. Uh, first is that uh, this U Ukraine situation, Russia's attacks on Ukraine, has sucked up all the oxygen in all the media. So the Chinese kind of get a free pass <laughs> of not having to explain themselves because everybody's focused on Russia. Uh, second, I think the China watchers here in this country are just holding their breath because they know China has designs on Taiwan. They know that if they don't, can't reintegrate it peacefully and economically, they will do so militarily one day. And so they don't know what to say here. Uh, so I, I sympathize with that, frankly, too. Mm -hmm. But that being said, uh, I think China and Russia are so different. Uh, China is a rising power, has great confidence. It views Taiwan as part of its own territory, as Russia is claiming it views Ukraine, but no one else sees it that way. Um, even we have a one China policy uh, where we recognize that there is one China and Taiwan is part of it. We just have two systems. Uh, not the case with Ukraine. It's a sovereign independent state. Russia recognized the sovereignty and independence of Ukraine from 1991 onward, uh, including in multiple, multiple documents, especially the Budapest Memorandum, where Russia uh, guaranteed Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity in exchange for Ukraine giving up nuclear weapons. So there, there's really no parallel between Taiwan and Ukraine in general, and certainly not in China's eyes. China doesn't like seeing Russia attack a sovereign neighboring state. Uh, that's not part of the international order China wants to see. China has patience and China has time on its side. I don't think it wants to be driven by Putin's timelines here at all. Uh, I think it views that it will eventually prevail. So we should be worried about China, but we shouldn't necessarily be worried in this moment. And let me finish with a question based on your past roles and the the opportunities you've had to advise administrations. If you were sitting in a seat today, Ambassador, and you were asked by this administration, what should we do next? Hmm. How would well, you answer the question? Yeah, I the basic answer, the fundamental answer here is we should lead. Uh, we should have a goal of supporting sovereignty, independence, democracy, market economy, rule of law, human rights. We want to live in a world that is conducive to the health and growth of the United States and a community around the United States of like-minded countries. That's what we want to do. So therefore, we should be proactive, 
We should be doing things to strengthen that community, strengthen those countries. Ukraine, right on the front line, needs our help the most, but also other countries like Moldova, like Georgia. We need to be proactive and not be on our back feet, hoping that Putin doesn't do something and then responding if he does. Uh, we ought to have a plan and we should be investing uh, leadership uh, for the future, because if we don't, it's not going to stop at Ukraine. It's going to be this country has problems, then Georgia has problems, then he's back to the Baltic states again, then he's uh, trying to divide NATO. Uh, we need to be the ones who are setting the agenda. Fantastic response. Thank you so much for that, Ambassador Volker. This is so uh, important, we believe, for our members around the country to be fully engaged on this topic. Uh, the ramifications, uh, not only for us in the short term, but the long term, uh, could be, like you said, a changing of, of world order. So this is uh, important and we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me.